in a world where most people watch movies and then forget about them. Three brave heroes join forces to watch them again and then talk about them. Join them in their epic journey as they go back in time, a decade and beyond, to revisit and break down films from a vast array of genres. Do these movies hold up over time? Are they classics? Find out on Retro Movie Roundtable. Starring your hosts, Brian Fry, John Flack, and Russell Guest. Coming now to Headphones in Your Ears. Welcome all you lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable. Welcome to where we watch movies and then talk about them. I'm your host, Russell Guest, and today I'm excited to say my good friend and co-host, Brian Fry, is here. Brian, how are you, man? Good afternoon, everybody. It's afternoon for me, evening for everyone else. It could be morning. It's a podcast. They can listen to it any time <laughs> they please. I like giving people a frame of reference. <laughs> okay. Well, it's 2 a.m. here then, because mm-hmm. I'm hardworking, and I will not rest until people know about their retro movies. Mostly for millennials. <laughs> so, Brian, are you excited? Russell, I'm always excited. The reason we're so excited today is because we have first-time guest Jordan Schwartz here joining the show from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, on site in downtown Pittsburgh. (laughs) Jordan, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for having me. If we sound echoey, it's because we're actually in the Wes Anderson Design Submarine from The Life Aquatic. Yeah, it's fantastic down here. Yes. (laughs) Uh, we all had to wear well, this certain like color scheme that Wes wanted yeah, us to wear. The so. orange, the blues, the shoes were good to go. Yes. Was anybody else disappointed that like there just wasn't a constant overtone of yellow submarine in that movie? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what? Wes is a Rolling Stones guy, though. He's he's a Stones over the Beatles guy. But they used the Beatles in this movie. They did. That's true. I agree yeah. with that. But more on that later because we haven't introduced that oh, yet. Yeah. We Who need knows? to get to know Jordan a little bit here. Oh, my. Jordan. These are the three questions that we felt would most define your character for the people at home okay. to know. Okay. Oh, God. Yes. So after this, they'll have the best idea of who you are, of anybody we've brought on the show. Of course. What was your favorite childhood movie? My childhood movie um, that I watched the, like a lot is definitely Harry Potter. I'm the big Potter head. Uh, Ron Weasley, all the way. Love that man. Um, and, yeah, I read the books and all the Okay, I've got to grill you for just a second. Oh, God, no. Uh, Don't what, test what? me. <laughs> <laughs> what what is your uh, schoolhouse? Okay, so according to Pottermore, which some would argue is like one of the most reliable you know exams for these things, I am a Gryffindor. But then recently I took an exam where an exam <laughs> a, a test where they kind of give you a, a percentage, and I was like forty. I was like a 40 percent in. Um, Oh crap! What was it? Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw. I had a forty and a forty. And Wait then a minute! Can you be? Out. Can you yeah. be a percent? Doesn't the Sorting Hat just tell you this is what you are? Exactly. You know, so, you're either Slytherin or here. You're yeah. in abnegation or whatever. And abnegation. <laughs> <laughs> Crossover. In my heart, I'm a Gryffindor, but I can see elements of Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw in my actions as well. But at my heart, I'm a Gryffindor. <laughs> Yeah, and on that note, Divergent made an entire movie out of the Sorting Hat it, scene of Harry yeah. Potter. Like, I was just like, man, this is two hours. And like, we got it. Yeah. We know what you get are. Let's get moving. <laughs> uh, Russell, like, what's your house? Uh, I, I like snakes. I think I'm a Slytherin. I, f- I feel like you are a Ravenclaw. I'm a Ravenclaw? Or may- I'm saying maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Let's... I, they didn't get in the movie okay. very much, so I, I didn't read the book. So What? I didn't read the books. I'm sorry. Shh, leave your own pot. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You're not in. Rip You're a muggle. <laughs> dirty, dirty muggle blood. Uh, biggest thrill movie, or sorry, what is the biggest thrill you've received in a movie? Okay, so most recently um, I watched The Post on an airplane, and I've gotten into the habit of watching very emotional movies on airplanes. So I'm that person that sits beside you and is just full on crying on the airplane. And The Post is one of these movies because there's a scene where Mel Streep is in a room full of professional men, and she's the only woman, and she's so extremely prepared for the meeting, and she looks down at her notes, and she just can't find the words. And I feel like I've been there, and puts I was like, edge. oh, puts me on the edge. I, I felt like I could feel how nervous, I felt like I was I was there with her, and I was, I was definitely on the edge of an uncomfortable seat mm. in that situation. <laughs> mm. yeah. So on an airplane, 
Uh, you, I hope you don't get airsick too, because like if you're crying and you get airsick, then, <laughs> no, then I don't want to sit next to you on a plane. Yeah, that would be but, kind of the worst. I mean, I keep my crying to myself, but if you'd look over, you'd be like, she's she's going through something right now. What is that? Man, she really doesn't want to sit next to me is what I would say. Yeah, you're like, crap. <laughs> so we recently came off the Oscars. Green Book just won Best Picture. Mm-hmm. But if you were to say, of all Oscar award winners, what is your favorite Oscar winning movie? It doesn't have to be Best Picture. It could be any okay. Oscar winner. So for for best picture, but not unfortunately not a winner. Call me by your name, really gripped me and touched me. It's such a beautiful movie. The the soundtrack and just the story of it and the way it's filmed mm-hmm. is just exquisite. And it really pulls you in. It's such a wonderful love story, and it oh, it grabs me. So if Jordan time. were Kanye West, she would have gone up <laughs> on that stage, ripped that hand, r- oh, ripped yeah. that Oscar award right away from Guillermo del Toro for <laughs> Shape of Water, and been like, "I'm sorry, Guillermo, you didn't deserve this." <laughs> Call me by your name, did. Yeah. <laughs> Mic drop. Honestly. Calls t- Timothy Chalamet to the stage. And then she would have added that, I'm a genius. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do say that on the regular, so it's very simple for me. <laughs> so going more current, what's the last movie you've seen? The last movie I saw um, was probably this one, or um, I was watching Phantom Thread, which was also last year's Oscars. Tell me more about Phantom Thread. I didn't see this. So Phantom Thread, um, I forget the main actor's name, but it's um, a fashion. It's about a man who runs a fashion house. Um, and, you know, he's, like, very well established. And then he kind of meets this woman who um, he begins to have a relationship with. And you learn about how he approaches his work. And he's kind of like a stick in the mud, old-fashioned. And then she kind of comes in and tries to change thing, things a little bit. But they have a very kind of interesting relationship between so this, the two of them. So this is the Daniel Day-Lewis movie. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that's okay. it. This is Daniel Day-Lewis. Um, but yeah, that was the one I had watched most recently. And it's, it's really interesting. He like sews, his thing is like he sews little messages into the linings of the garments and about how like each garment has a story. So it sounds like um, you would recommend this. Yes, it's very like it's, I think if you're into like uh, fashion or beautiful movies or kind of of that time period of like uh, kind of like romance and, and fashion and like couture it is very interesting to see and then there's like a little drama in there too um but so it's the devil wears prada it is the devil wears prada without the amazingness that is no is that meryl streep who's in the devil yeah meryl streep yeah without the amazingness of meryl streep because she just is amazing in that movie <laughs> okay okay and so today, we're going to talk about, Jordan, what was the movie that we're doing today? We are talking about Wes Anderson's The Royal Tenenbaums. That's right. This movie came, comes out in 2001. It grosses $52.3 million. Uh, that's not necessarily a box office mm-hmm. smash, but that's not how Wes Anderson chooses to operate. This, came, this comes in 48th uh, in the 2001 standings. Behind the movie Blow, which is a terrible movie in my opinion, <laughs> and ahead of the movie Exit Wounds. Uh, IMDb gives this 7.6 out of 10. And the critics of Rotten Tomatoes give this an 80%, and the audience likes it considerably more and gives it an 89%. So pretty high praise from Rotten Tomatoes community. Uh, it is, this is an Oscar-nominated movie itself, and it was Oscar-nominated for Best Original Screenplay. It lost to Gosford Park, though. And uh, But don't feel too sad for it, because at the Golden Globes, Gene Hackman uh, won the Golden Globe for his performance uh, for Best Actor, beating out Hugh Jackman, Ewan McGregor, John Cameron Mitchell, and Billy Bob Thornton. Mm. So, uh, so got- let me get this straight. This came in in the general ballpark of the instant classic Exit Wounds, featuring <laughs> Steven Seagal and DMX. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I mean, that's, wow. I mean, X gonna give it to you. (laughs) He always does. So, a little bit before we get going, let's just see. uh, Jordan, had you seen this movie before? If so, when and how long had it been? Yes, so I had seen this movie before. I would say I watched it for the last time last year. Um, Over the summer, my two roommates and I, um, my one roommate is very much... It, well, he's into films and he like is into Wes Anderson and Wes Anderson was kind of the first filmmaker that I started researching and mm-hmm. just wanted to learn more about his movies. So we went through like a Wes Anderson period where we started with Bottle Rocket and then went to Rushmore, Royal Ten and Bombs and kind of walked through the whole them. process. Yeah, we we didn't something happened and we didn't finish it. Um, oh. But so I had seen the movie before, but that was kind of that was about a year ago that I saw it the last time before uh-huh. now. 
I don't know what it is. Architects, and by the way, Jordan, as an architect, yes. as mentioned, architects seem to gravitate towards Wes Anderson. I think. I mean, it's his. I think it's his lines, his color. There's something very like the way he frames things. It feels the shots feel architectural. Maybe. A little bit. Yeah. And I have to be in a very particular mood to uh, watch a Wes Anderson movie. Okay. So had you seen this one before, Brian? What was your background on this? Uh, no, I had not seen this before. Oh, fine. Um, as you know, I have an allergy to Ben Stiller. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, and I, I, I do try to keep him uh, further than arm's length. But uh, I, yeah, I just, it's one of the, those things. And uh, I think everybody's got a person that they're just not super thrilled yep. with. Jennifer Lopez here. He's <laughs> one of those guys that uh, he's one of those guys that like, or unlike, I should say, um, Adam Sandler, I prefer Ben Stiller in serious roles. It's when he's being funny that I don't like him. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Or trying, or sh- should say trying to be funny. Uh, it's it's just the look at all the bad things that happened to me comedy that I, I just can't get behind. Uh, they're, well, bad things they're just no the care. kind of movies that make me want to melt into my seat. So. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, so did you like the movie or being that this was your first time through? I would – this movie is, was kind of like purgatory to me. I like I finished it and I was kind of like, okay, that happened. Mm. That is fascinating. That is interesting. So you're going to be coming at this one from a different angle because I've seen this movie probably about four times you in total. Watching. Yeah, I, I, I have watched it. And my first time watching it was like – I really was not that versed in the dramedy genre because mm-hmm. today we're doing a dramedy and mm-hmm. I was like, I didn't know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this wasn't funny. It wasn't like profound or, and so. Uh, yeah, well, that, that was kind of my point though. I mean, it was just, it was very just like, mm, okay. Yeah, I didn't know what to do with it. And then uh, in college, I watched it because uh, some of my friends had a studio where they actually had to design a house for the Tenenbaums, like no as a project. Way. And so you had to look at all the characteristics of the people and mm-hmm. respond to that. It was like a short little two-week project. It was kind of cool. I, I, I envied them and I wanted to be in that yeah. class. I wasn't in it though, but I watched the movie with some people who did have to do it. Mm-hmm. And then after graduating from college, I watched it again. Mm-hmm. And then I watched it again for this podcast a few yeah. times. So I have to say, somehow... I get the story, I get it more and more, and somehow, maybe through other Wes Anderson adventures like the Darjeeling Limited, mm-hmm. Life Aquatic, and uh, my, my personal West favorite Wes Anderson's Grand Budapest Hotel. <sighs> um, so maybe I'm learning to appreciate the, it's like a dish that you get and like you don't necessarily know that spice spectrum to begin with. Mm-hmm. I think I've learned to like Wes Anderson a little bit more. And I actually quite like this movie now. So I had a mm-hmm. slow growth of, if I'd only seen this once, I probably would have been like eh, two, 2.5 stars and yeah. called it a day. Mm-hmm. And over over time, I've, I've grown to like it. So it's an interesting, it, mm-hmm. this one has grown on me. Yeah, for sure. So it's funny, I have tried several times to watch Isle of Dogs and I'm oh. apparently not allowed to. Uh, <laughs> this isn't from my wife. This is from my dog. Uh, oh. He barks at basically any animal, even <laughs> animated ones, on the television. And somehow, every time I start to watch it, he knows, and he comes to find me, and then he barks at the television. <laughs> so uh, we found this out uh, about eight months ago when he barked at the unicorn on Blade Runner. So no watching Homeward Bound for you. Honestly. No. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I even have to steer clear of westerns, man. It was tough to get through Unforgiven because oh. he'd be like, where's the horse at? <laughs> oh, gosh, the horse? Okay. Where'd the horse at? Anyway, uh, so yep. we're going to get into today's movie. We're going to have to spoil it. So if you haven't seen The Royal Ten Bounce, there's a lot of stuff in this movie that you don't want spoiled. I do recommend that you go see the movie, come back, and enjoy our breakdown of it. So when we come back, I can't believe it, uh, yet another former president has come in to endorse the show here today to give us his uh, blessing and give us his endorsement on the show is George W. Bush. Take it easy, America. George W. Bush, everybody. Wow. G-dub. G- <laughs> you know what? Are you missing him right now? God, I mean, that was great. I I heard on a movie once that he has really good weed. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. I feel like he would. Well, it goes well with his SpongeBob enjoyment, so. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> plot summary. Uh, Jordan, refresh people's minds who have not seen The Royal Tenenbaums in quite some time. All right, guys. <clears throat> the Royal Tenenbaums focuses on the trials and tribulations of the Tenenbaum family. Royal Tenenbaum, the father, played by Gene Hackman, 
is seeking to reconnect with his children and wife after 22 years apart. Ethelene, the mother, led by An Angela Huston, dedicated her life to raising their three children as prodigies in his absence. Chaz, Ben Stiller, a math genius who started his own mouse breeding business as a child, now struggles to raise his two children, Ari and Uzi, after their mother died in a terrible plane crash. Margot, Gwyneth Paltrow, adopted by the Tenenbaums but never fully accepted by her father, was a successful playwright but now spends most of her time soaking in the tub and watching TV. Richie, Luke Wilson, a tennis prodigy and budding painter, had a very public meltdown during one of the most important games of his life and now travels the world on a cruise ship. As Ethelene and her longtime accountant slash lover, Henry, played by Danny Glover, host their bridge club at the family home, Chaz arrives unannounced, claiming that he and the boys will need to stay at the house for a bit because of a lack of updated sprinklers at their own home. Despite the fact that the Tenenbaum house doesn't even have sprinklers, and this is clearly a sign of a nervous breakdown, Chaz and his boys move in. As Margot gets word that Chaz has moved home, she admits that she too is depressed and proceeds to move back home as well. To the dismay of her husband Raleigh, played by Bill Murray, Richie follows suit and Ethleen soon finds herself with a house full of children once again. In an attempt to get the forgiveness and love of his family, Royal, with the help of his longtime assistant Pagoda, played by Kumar Palana, fakes a diagnosis of stomach cancer, saying he has six weeks to live, and moves into the Tenenbaum home. Royal uses his proximity to his children and wife as an opportunity to repair their relationships. His relationship with Chaz has been, a, has been sour since Chaz found out Royal was stealing money from his, him as a child. Margot has never had a picture-perfect relationship with her father, and things worsen as he scolds her for sleeping with Eli Cash, played by Owen Wilson, who has been trying to be a part of the Tenenbaum family since playing with them as a child. Things take a turn for the worse when Henry exposes Royal's fake cancer to the rest of the family and Royal's kicked out of the house. During the same time, Raleigh, with the help of Richie, has hired a private investigator to dig into Margot's secret past. The two men find out that Margot has had quite the series of lovers, which is devastating to both men as her brother Richie has been in love with her since they met. This sends Richie into a spiral and after shaving off all of his hair, he attempts to take his life. Luckily he is found, taken to the hospital, and survives a tragedy. As the whole family is sitting in the hospital waiting room, Richie escapes and finds Margot at home in his tent. The two express their mutual feelings for one another, but agree that it must remain a secret. Hoping to turn a new leaf, Richie enlists the help of Royal and Pagoda to help him take Eli to rehab. The three are unsuccessful and Eli escapes out the window. In these events, Royal has had a change of heart and decides to finally divorce Ethelene so that she can marry Henry. On the day of the wedding, things are going well until Eli comes barreling down the street and crashes the car into the family home, nearly hitting Ari and Uzi. This sends Chaz into a fit of rage and he proceeds to chase Eli through the entire house and over the backyard fence. As the two lie on their backs in the neighbor's backyard, they agree that they both need help. A wave of resolution washes over the family as they clean up from the excitement. Royal buys a new dog for Ari and Uzi as theirs was killed by Eli in the crash and Chaz finally admits that he's been having a tough time since his wife died. Margot and Richie are comfortable in their arrangement, and Ethelene and Henry proceed to get married the next day. The dysfunctional Tenenbaum family are finally at peace and are able to move on. Years later, Royal dies of a heart attack, and Chaz is the only one to witness his death. The entire cast of characters is present at Royal's funeral, where his epitaph reads, Royal O'Reilly Tenenbaum died tragically, rescuing his family from the wreckage of a destroyed, sinking battleship. The end. Wow, well done. And Brian, I don't know if you noticed this or not, your usual cast rundown was largely inclusive in that. Are there any other casting uh, choices you wanted to throw in there before we move forward? You know, I'm actually good. Uh, that was fantastic. <laughs> I love how you did that. I'm going to take a minute just to discuss how I feel about the casting in the new Wolverine movie. Perfect. <laughs> um, largely off topic and perfect for this vacant spot right now. Um <laughs> Largely thought to be Tom Hardy. I'm like 50-50 eh, on that one. Um, really would like to see Scott Eastwood get the part. Uh, that way, if they ever do another old, old man Logan movie, uh, we could get uh, Clint Eastwood in a yeah. superhero film. Um, you know, there, there's a couple other people. The guy from um, Vikings is uh, being looked at, Travis uh, Fennell. Mm. Um, or they could just go with a uh, straight-up, a throwback to X-23 and use Daphne and Kane and uh, nix the, the male Wolverine altogether. Tenenbaums, anyway, Brian. Just Tenenbaums. 
Oh, like I said, I was just going to use this vacant. Uh, this is something that's been weighing heavily on my mind. And I just figure I'd chuck it in right here. Yeah. All right. I mean, we didn't mention kind of big narrator. I didn't mention the narrator. Either. Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin. Is your narrator. That's yes. True. Alec Baldwin, narrator. Uh, there we go. I, I work some cast in there. Or she works some cast in there. <laughs> yeah, she had your back on that one. <laughs> I got she, you. she did your jorb. <laughs> um, so. He took her jorbs. <laughs> God, he took her jorbs. <laughs> Here, what I found interesting and that I somehow didn't realize the first couple times that I watched this is mm-hmm. just how you've got Royal, and he's a really selfish individual who really Surely. is a horrible father. Just, yeah. you know, he doesn't care about anybody else but himself. Mm-hmm. And something that's interesting is even though he runs out of money and his motivation is financial for trying to get a place to stay mm-hmm. and he tries to pull his family back together, he actually finds himself liking it. And he begins to heal himself, but in turn, everybody who comes back to the family has a wound. Yes. Richie has a wound, and and Chaz has, has you know, mm-hmm. he's suffering from his wife being passed away, and and Margot has just really never been fulfilled, uh, you know, even yeah. from parents or from a loving relationship, mm-hmm. and so they all come back home to their parents' house, which is in a sense of like comfort for them, because it's probably yeah. the last time they were happy when mm-hmm. they were geniuses and like they had their heyday in the seventies. Yeah. And so. I just thought it was interesting how they all began to heal together, even yeah. though nobody fixes their problems. Somehow, it's just far more uh, bearable to take on as a family, and, and exactly. simply reinserting himself back into the family mm-hmm. actually helps bring everybody together. So, anyway, Brian, what are your thoughts on the story of the movie? Mm-hmm. I am not a hundred percent convinced <laughs> that Gene Hackman was a terrible father. I understand that he did some crummy things, like, but, you know, thus are people. So, you know, I think back to when he was playing, like, BB guns with the kids. Like, he didn't do stuff. He did traditional stuff that would say, okay, he's a bad father. But if my dad shot me with a BB gun, that's a hilarious story. Like, but what if your dad stole money from your very successful business as a child? <laughs> or kept announcing to everybody when you met them as like, this is my adoptive daughter, yeah. Margot. <laughs> Clear lines. It's, all right, so so right there, he's being accurate. He doesn't say this is <laughs> my adoptive daughter that I don't love. <laughs> oh, man. It's insinuated, for did sure. You see, did you see the play yeah. scene, like where she puts on a play, writes a whole play, and oh, he goes, yeah. I just found the whole thing to be very unbelievable. There's yeah. just a bunch of kids on stage. What do I know? One of the things that... Yeah, I get it. I get it. He's a dick. Yeah. But, but it, it, uh, I don't know. In the research that I was doing, um, this was from... Uh, let me see if I can find it. It's from a YouTube channel. Um, they were talking about how one of like the common themes in Wes Anderson movies is children acting and speaking like adults and then adults acting like children which i feel like with royal really makes sense because in that scene like margo like all the way that when the children speak and they're having that little press conference yeah like Chaz is like commanding the room like 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 he is an adult yeah and then there's that scene where royal takes ari and uzi which oh let me see if i can find the quote he says something like let's take things out and chop them up um anyways but yeah he says like he says something like that and then he takes the children like literally just running through the street they are jumping into the pool they're riding on a trash truck like just like bizarre very kid-like things so Mm -hmm. i guess when you look like that's a thing for wes anderson is this you know attitude wise so I just kind of assumed that he treated his kids like he was treating his grandkids. And the whole time he was with the grandkids, I was like, that's the best granddad ever. But it, it kind so, of seems like he like, he's doing had a better relationship with the yeah. grandkids than his actual he kids. He did. And part of the reason he was doing it was to kind of stick it to the old man. He even said as much. Like, you yeah. know, like because Chaz was really uptight and he just was oh, getting so under uptight. his skin by being uh, there to help his uh, grandchildren break some rules and have some yeah. fun. Uh, running out into traffic, maybe not a good idea. But oh, literally, he was like, we were like, let's wait, and then the moment the car started going, he was like, let's go. I was like, this is not a good idea. How is this fun? Shoplifting. Yeah, so, oh yeah, the shoplifting. So on the on that note, is being a good grandfather in a way being a good dad? No. I mean, because there's think like different. A benefit to that. Hmm. I mean, maybe, but I feel like. Well, I mean, if you look at the movie, like it kind of takes. Chaz, like he he's put up such this high wall, and then it takes like 
Eli almost killing his kid. Like, basically, because his kids were in the plane when his wife went down as well. So he sure. luckily was able to have them. So it's like it took them almost dying again for him to, like, kind of snap out of it and realize, like, oh, oh, I, I really need help. Oh, I'm really low. So I feel like Royal maybe did help to kind of push push those buttons to kind of help him see so, what so he's struggling with. I do want to touch on it because I see that you're making a point. So you're – Say so. One of the reasons that you're coming at this from a different angle is you're saying Royal's not such a bad guy. Is that right, Brian? Correct. Which I would agree with. He's not too bad. Interesting. I I, I, I mean, they I don't use think he's evil. One or two. They use one or two staples to try to nail home this guy's a bad dude, and then they use an entire movie of subtlety to say, or is he? Yeah. I think I think he is not. I don't think he goes out of his way. Like, I don't think he, like, you know. He's, he can just, he's neglect. Yeah, exactly. He's neglectful I mean, as and Henry selfish. puts it, what's he say? He says something like, I don't think you're a bad guy. I just think you're a son of a bitch or something like yeah. that. And you're like, oh, that's that's oh, so accurate. He just is. Thank you. I really, I really, that means the world. Yeah, exactly. You're like, he's just a son of a bitch. Like, that's what he is. Interesting. So, yeah. I mean, uh, I also, and like I said, uh, uh, the more times I've seen this, the more I've taken the time to assess each of the children's issues and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, Chaz is really in mourning for his wife and he can't get over it. So he's so worried about safety. And so, like, he comes back home to his parents, even though it's no safer than his apartment and <laughs> anything like that. And so it was important to him just to come back home just because it felt like some safe place that was in his memory. Richie comes back for his dad, but I mean, he has left the world. He's on a boat. Like he had a total yeah. meltdown on the tennis courts and like, yeah. you know, he's he's not in a good place. And uh, Margot, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, she is locked herself in a bathroom and she doesn't mm-hmm. even talk to her husband. She's married to a man that she has no feelings for. And honestly, the part of this movie that made me feel the worst was I felt really bad for Bill Murray's character. Like that's who I don't feel good I for. I feel like if, if it wasn't Bill Murray, if it was someone else, if it was any other actor that wasn't, like, Mr. Bill Murray, like, beloved, we wouldn't notice. He would just be kind of like a schmuck. And I think because he's Bill Murray, he gives more agency to the character. But if it wasn't Bill Murray, we wouldn't even really think think about him too much. Maybe. You know? Maybe. I don't know. I mean... Because you're like, that's Bill Murray! Like, you're, what are you doing? She leaves him high and dry in the she end. She does. She and really so, does. Anyway, uh, so, Brian, what's your take on the three children... Uh, as they've grown up and have these set of problems Mm -hmm. and they come back home and their problems are basically, they're forced to face their problems uh, with their family. So I don't know if it ties in to kind of my opinion of Gene Hackman or Mm -hmm. maybe this goes to your point about him being actually a bad dad, Mm -hmm. but I didn't like any of them as people. Wow. Um, <laughs> your your hatred for Ben I, Stiller has has made you like Gene Hackman as a father. You're, you're rooting. You're like the guy in the serial killer movie was like, "Yes, slice up the teenagers. Yay. Go get him, Jason." <laughs> well, first off, you got Luke Wilson who's basically aloof the entire movie, like yeah. in some way or another. You've got Gwyneth Paltrow who might actually be the worst person. Wait, like Gwyneth Paltrow as a person and, or Gwyneth Paltrow's character? No, oh, no, no. Yeah, he means, yeah. he means yeah. Margot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Margot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, who might be the worst person yeah. in the movie in terms of their character. And then you have Ben Stiller who's gone through a traumatic thing mm-hmm. and he's probably the most relatable person in the in the movie. You but, heard it here. Brian Fry said Ben Stiller's character <laughs> is the most relatable person in the movie. Go on. Like I said, this is this is – probably one of the most palatable parts. Like I said, I, per- I personally prefer him to mm-hmm. be in a serious role for me to take it. Okay. So, um, yeah, I just, I, I guess in the end, I'm just like, oh, all of you are a lot. Yeah. Like, okay. I, I felt did... bad for mom because I'm like, wow, you had to put up with an entire adolescence of this? Mm-hmm. I'm coming to understand meanwhile, how your take on this movie is what it is, but uh, yeah. It, I, yeah. It, meanwhile, Gene Hackman is this like whimsical guy, but he's like the only part of it that's not. Can, is it possible to be full of yourself and not full of yourself at the same time? No. Like, how it, is no. he not full of himself? Yeah, yeah I yeah, think he's say, completely full of yeah, himself. He's one of the most selfish people you can ever meet. Is yeah. what the story tells. Like that whole scene where he's first, like he comes to Ethel and she's like, "Get out of here." And he's like, I'm sick. And he's like, I'm sick, I'm sick. And she just starts losing it. And he's like, 
wait, just kidding. She's yeah. like, what? And then she goes to walk away. He's like, no, 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 I'm sick. Like, he lies. What? He lies about having cancer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who does that? Yeah, yeah who does that? I, I, but like I said, like there's, he has a couple staples that put him up as one thing, but he has an entire movie of subtle things that make him the most human person outside of the mom. It's a story yeah. of redemption, too. Yeah. And I think that's what you're getting so, into, because mm-hmm. he does spend the whole movie. He even says, I, I really messed up. For decades, I've messed up. Mm-hmm. But if I want to try and fix it here at the end of my life, can you please let me? And they have a hard time letting him. Uh, because, again, it has been decades. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting. And you're right. He is likable in the sense of he is finding his way back into things. But I think he accidentally stumbles his way into things. He's, he's trying to deceive yeah. the family into mm-hmm. basically getting a place to stay and getting money and he's basically looking to swindle them. But in the end, he realizes when he says that he, uh, he's leaving and they're kicking him out, he said, these have been the best six days of my life. Yeah. And then the narrator comes on and says, yeah, the moment he said that, he then realized that they were true. Yeah. And then so. later when he's getting um, ice cream with Margot at that fancy restaurant, he says, can't someone be a shit their whole life and try to make up for it? I mean, don't people want to hear that? And Margot goes, do they? Yeah. She's like, I guess. So you can see he's like, this is a redemption story. And she's like, I don't, I'm not in her, like, maybe. She, she's not quite there for yeah. it as much. Yeah, and this, I, I remember my first time passing through, so maybe being in Brian Shoes a little bit, mm-hmm. I thought the whole whimsical style and, like, you know, the old retro tunes and stuff like that, meeting the yes. family, everybody's talking in this quirky manner, getting acquainted with Wes Anderson. This was my first Wes Anderson experience, going, like, mm-hmm. okay, this is different. This yeah. is this is quirky. But then contrast that later on, you've got a woman leaving her husband, you've got a mm-hmm. guy trying to commit suicide, you've got yeah. a guy faking his own death, and it goes beyond being funny at some point, and it starts to, like, really hurt people. And then you're starting to be like, whoa, this is going way darker, yeah. way more serious. Again, it's a dramedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, way, way darker than I ever thought it would. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't sure how to deal with that. Again, like you said, I now know what I'm getting in for when I go back to this yeah. movie. So I'm able to mm-hmm. see, I guess, I gave him able to see the redemption story. I'm able to see that yeah. the family recovers together. Yeah. So I, I feel like because the story hits that low point of of uh, Richie attempting to take his life, it really gives some weight to the story. Because I feel like with a Wes Anderson film, you're like I'm in for the visual, the in for the visuals. Like I'm here for the characters. Like everyone is so it fits their character so well, and you could just kind of be in the world and just kind of watching and being entertained but then that scene I feel like really brings it back in and makes the issues seem more real versus like oh Margot's just this weird character this is this other weird character like that kind of brings you like oh no this is real stuff that we're talking about here and it kind of like yeah brings you back so I did want to we kind of got off on the casting Mm -hmm. and I did want to point out a few interesting fun tidbits about the cast Gene Wilder actually turns down to play the role of Royal Tenenbaum uh, he was retired, but they came back to him and said that we wanted you for this part. And mm-hmm. I got to say, that would also be pretty good, too. Uh, not that Hackman did a bad job, but I love mm-hmm. Gene Wilder uh, from Willy Wonka. Uh, that would have been really interesting. Angelica Houston and Gene Hackman actually both initially turned their roles down. Mm-hmm. And they had to go back and write more depth and put them into the movie more mm-hmm. in order to get these guys to come on board. So uh, they got their they got their people, and they had to do some rewriting. And then Gene Hackman uh, mentioned in interviews that he was somewhat hesitant to take the part because he felt that uh, himself that it had been so insensitive to his own family that he was worried that he would offend them and make them uncomfortable uh, because he himself felt like he hasn't been the best father. And so his family went ahead and said, go ahead, take the role, do your own thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, oddly enough, they might have been saying, uh, yeah, this is perfect Mm -hmm. for you. You're you're a natural. Yeah, honestly. I was listening to a podcast... Um, where they interviewed, this was in 2011 that the interview took place, they interviewed Wes Anderson about the movie. Uh-huh. And he was talking about, I mean, if you look at Wes Anderson movies, there are, like, the staples, like, Owen, oh, the Wilson twins, like, Owen Wilson and him were friends from college and uh, uh-huh. University of Texas, Austin. Um, so they were, like, making Bottle Rocket as just, like, a film. Um, and then, like, so... Wes Anderson kind of likes to write for... He kind of has a group of people that he... He's very loyal. Yeah, and he likes to write for them. Um, 
And with so, them too. Yeah, because oh, all, of every, every Wes Anderson project's always co written. He's also one of the creepiest looking people I've ever yes. seen. Yes. So what's crazy is when I feel like, one, when I pictured what Wes Anderson looked like, and then I saw a photo of him, it was like the same. Like when you picture someone with the name Wes Anderson and you see little mouse Wes Anderson, it looks the same. But then hearing him talk, he has this kind of dark sense of humor. Like he has a sense of humor, which I feel like if you look at him, you just think he was like a quiet artsy type. Is it wrong to say that he kind of looks like Dudley without the hat and the glasses? Yes, with like blonde hair, like a little more sheepish. Yes. Dudley is a very, he's so funny in this movie. Yes. Um, but yeah, so uh, when Wes Anderson was talking about like going after Hackman, Hackman didn't even want to take the, like didn't want to meet with Wes Anderson at all. Really? Yeah, did not want to meet with him. And he also doesn't like roles being written for him because he doesn't want to be put in a box. He wants to just have a role written, and then he goes in and he like gives his own take. Huh. And then also, um, Wes was talking about how when he was, uh, like, uh, Hackman was running his lines, and Wes Anderson took a look at his script, and <laughs> Gene Hackman had crossed out all of the kind of like stage directions or feelings that would let you know how, like, this is kind of going back to how the screenplay is written, but like, how Wes Anderson would want it to sound, he mm. crossed all that out. Because he really just wants, like, these are the lines, this is how I'm going to do it, this is what I bring to the role. Interesting. And didn't, didn't want to kind of rely on this, the beautiful Wes Anderson frame that was created for him. That's interesting, because yeah. that goes along the lines of what I was reading mm-hmm. also. Apparently Hackman, and this is makes me sad, because I really enjoy him as an actor, but apparently he can be difficult to work with as yeah. an actor, along the lines of what Wes Anderson said about. he was scary. Yes. <laughs> and so... Uh, Wes Anderson thought it would be a fun, relaxing experience with Hackman, but it turned out that it did not transpire that way. Uh, they ended up having verbally abusive, angry uh, altercations with each other over trivial matters. The extent of the frustrations became so uh, bad that Gwyneth Paltrow and Angelica Houston uh, would try and avoid uh, Hackman altogether. And uh, Bill Murray, uh, who is friends with Wes Anderson, uh, intervened frequently as kind of a senior member of the cast and uh, you know and was there to basically be moderator and to look out for Wes in particular uh, and would come in on days where he wasn't even shooting to make the show go yeah so he was very protective over his cast again Wes has a tight family and Bill's in that family Mm -hmm. and so uh, Gene uh, you don't he doesn't you don't see him in that ring and there's a reason for that there was a lot of friction in this movie what's interesting though is you would think with that relationship being so bad it would show in the acting performance but it doesn't and it doesn't yeah in fact it's a golden globe winning performance yeah, but uh, like i said uh you're not going to see a max back like the wilson brothers or adrian brody or like yeah. you know all the uh, bill murray or schwartz and yeah. all these other guys so mm-hmm. And one last casting note worth mentioning, Danny Glover, Luke Wilson, and Owen Wilson all turned down roles in Ocean's Eleven in 2001 to appear in this particular movie. Holy crap. That's right. So Ocean's Eleven could have been very different. Maybe it would have been Ocean's 14, I don't know. (laughs) I'm actually really okay with that. I I have a crush on the Ocean's movies cast. Um, I, I absolutely love it. I wouldn't have wanted to see that. I, I don't. I don't know who they would have replaced in any of yeah. these parts. So it is a fun exercise to try and get yourself. I could maybe see Danny Glover replacing Saul, maybe the older man. Oh, I don't. I don't know. I'm not. As, oh, I like the, seen those movies the, in a long time. Uh, the other, the aging hotel. Yeah. Owner. Okay. Maybe the, 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 I can only speculate. Yeah. So. Uh, hmm. You know, it's not the you know, it's not the uh, acrobatic martial artist kind of guy who can he's the escape artist. It's not oh, him. Oh yeah, so. yeah. That's <laughs> so anyway, maybe uh, Owen Wilson is Scott Kahn's character. Maybe, maybe I could see I could see both Owen Wilson and Luke Wilson taking Casey Affleck's role in the other uh, brother who like <laughs> blow stuff up and argue with each other because they yeah. were actually brothers. That's Scott Kahn. Oh yeah. Oh then we're, we're we're in agreement. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Um, we're on the same page. We got this. Yes. So, now it's time to talk extensively, because there's so much to talk about about Wes Anderson. He helped write this movie with Owen Wilson, as Jordan was mentioning. Wes Anderson always writes with one or two other people, and uh, it's part of his process and how he writes. Mm -hmm. Um, But he also brings a very interesting style to it. So, Brian, what do you think about Wes Anderson as a director? Well, you guys kind of touched on earlier how much you enjoy Wes Anderson movies, and I kind of mentioned that I have just have to be in the right mood for it. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a type of wit that is very hit or miss with me, and so I don't want to go so far as to say I 
typically avoid his movies because, mm-hmm. um, like I said, I've been trying to watch Isle of Dogs. But, well, I'm just saying I'm not trying to say it like that. Um, but oddly enough, uh, his style is something that I don't dislike. Mm-hmm. And I'll say a kind of a funny statement here. My favorite Wes Anderson movie isn't a Wes Anderson movie. So, um, explain yourself styling, now, <laughs> say more now in that styling. One of my favorite movies of all time is pirate radio, which is a very Wes Anderson esque movie, huh. but it's not a Wes Anderson so it's not a- movie. <laughs> yeah. So it's just one of those things where I give him the nod for his own personal take and style. Mm-hmm. Um, I would call it a Wes Anderson style movie because, you know, I don't even remember who directed pirate radio. I just know it wasn't him, but it's a very Wes Anderson movie. So I give him the nod that he has his own flavor. It's not really something you see elsewhere very much, but, um, yeah, it's just, uh, I, I've just got to be in the right place for it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So describe to the audience when you say this is going to hit you in a good mood, like it's just like, on, when is the time? I mean, there's not. It's not like a okay. 3 p.m. on Tuesday. I'm in the mood for West. A Anderson. full it's moon. Not, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it's more just one of those things where I'm scrolling through stuff and I'm like, you know what? I could do Darjeeling Limited right now. Mm. Now's the time. All right. All right. So uh, it's Jordan, just, it's just got to strike in. You don't really know what that mood is until it it's there. That's fair. Okay. Jordan, what are your takes on Wes Anderson as a director? As a director, I mean, like we were saying earlier, like architectural, I feel like his shots are really interesting. And the Grand, I think, like you were saying, the, for me, the Grand Budapest Hotel, I think was the first Wes Anderson movie that I had watched. Really? And I, I was just blown. I was like, what is this? I'm in a different world right now. The colors, the way that everything is framed, how peculiar the, the characters are. Mm-hmm. I, I just was instantly like, this is so different from whatever movies I'm usually watching. Mm -hmm. And I think that was what kind of sparked my interest of, well, if this is so different, why is it so different and all these things? So, I mean, he definitely, I'm curious about if he has attitudes about color theory or things like that. He most certainly does. Oh, do you you have? There'll be some on that. But go ahead and continue. Um, So, like, color theory or um, just, I don't know. Like, it's a very, like you were saying, like, he has such a specific style. But I think, I think for me, I like the way that he approaches story and, like, his characters. They're so, they're so, I don't know, unique. And if I can, oh, here we go. So from, this is taken from, um, the YouTube channel is called The Take by Screen Prism. Um, and the critic Matt Zoller cites was talking about material synecdoche. Synecdoche? Synecdoche. Yeah. Synecdoche? That's yeah. like whatever. So showcasing objects, locations, and articles of clothing that define personalities, relationships, and conflicts. And mm-hmm. I feel like that, I was trying to find a word that describes like the ness, like the Wes Anderson ness of something. Yeah. Yeah. So I just feel like that, the way that he approaches that and the way he understands material synecdoche is, is it like says so, he knows how to paint a story and paint a world in this kind of quirky little way. It also sounds like a dessert, like instead of spumoni, yeah. like give me a side dish of Schenectady. Oh yeah, I'd be like, that sounds delicious. <laughs> I, I'll have one right now. I, I was just thinking it sounded like a cell phone service or an internet service provider that it's um, like in the middle of Montana. <laughs> like join Schenectady. Very niche, very niche. So in this movie, like one of them that they talked about on this YouTube channel, and I agree with this, like Chaz and his two sons wearing those red jumpsuits. Mm-hmm. And then when they go to the funeral, it's the black jumpsuits. But kind of like, you know, just by visually looking at them. what And they all have the same haircut. Yes. Like you just kind of know about them. And then Margot and Richie um, are very popular Halloween costumes, which I think goes to show if you can, and like what they're wearing isn't too crazy of an outfit. It's, it's but dated it's, to a time. Oh, of course. And it's, it's iconic. Like, you know, you're like, I know those characters. I've seen that somewhere. Like, what is that? So... I think it really like they know how to or um in that is it, a good couple's costume right yeah. yeah and in the grand budapest hotel the um oh uh the main character's perfume yes the parfum of whatever i forget what it's called <laughs> um like that kind of it shows you it tells you so much about the character and it's it's, it's fascinating so that was a term that i was like this describes wes anderson and how kind of a master he is of this specific absolutely area. 
No, the, that is absolutely, that's a big part of it mm -hmm. for him. I thought, uh, one of the things that I thought was interesting in studying this is you see influences of how he frames shots in terms of he loves the wide angle lens, yeah. he loves a sense of symmetry, frequently direct symmetry, sometimes asymmetrical balance, but uh, he frames these things in such a way that they have a stage-like performance yes. or like the way that he pans very bluntly and the camera moves to the side mm -hmm. and it's like turning a page in a book yeah. and he has a certain presentation that is unique to him it's book like or stage like mm -hmm. and uh, he also takes influences from Orson Welles, François Trudeau, French Nouveau uh, film as well as even Stanley Kubrick with mm -hmm. his symmetrical shots mm -hmm. and I just I started to see some of these influences in there. Again, uh, as you mentioned, he has a very architectural way of shooting. Mm -hmm. A lot of times he uses these very straight lines and forced perspectives yeah. in his shots. And he composes his people in such a way mm -hmm. to where the light's coming in and not. Uh, he's, it's, it's a pretty film. And if you ever felt like, I get this feeling, but I don't really know what's going on, that's the subliminal feeling yeah. that he's definitely giving you. And so, uh, and how he breaks things down with the stop motion sometimes. And uh, that's, I just, he has mm -hmm. a really good bag of tricks for me that I've come to learn to appreciate. And what's interesting is if I had just seen the Tenom albums, mm -hmm. I don't think I would have gotten it. In yeah. a way that it's a methodology that he's taken and refined and done over and mm -hmm. over again, it's kind of interesting. He keeps going back to the same bag of tricks, and in a way, it makes me appreciate them more. Yeah. People were also talking about his way of writing dialogue, which. I was able to, after hearing that and then watching the movie again, was able to recognize in this movie, but I just think of um, The Fantastic Mr. Fox, which is a movie that I, I can just keep watching because I love the movie, and I feel like the voices and the speaking in that movie especially, I don't know if it's because it's stop motion, I think are, I don't know, really eloquent in the way, in the way that the speech is and the voices. Um, I think it's Meryl, who is it? Is Meryl Streep in that movie? Uh, other than Clooney, I, I don't know the casting on the anime. But like even Clooney's voice, I feel like it just fits. It fits so well, and like the way that they write the lines, it's very good. It's very good. So, Brian, maybe this is one of the things I want to ask you. I find that what she's talking about here, Wes Anderson has a certain dry, exact, or deadpan, mm -hmm. exacted delivery that is uniquely designed. Nobody talks this way. And he does it with his characters and has all of his actors do this to deliver his kind of humor and to run the show the way that he wants to, to give it the tone that he wants to. It's not realistic, but I find that this is the thing that rubs people who don't like Wes Anderson uh, the wrong way, if you know what I mean. Is this, is this true for you, or is this not a... How, how about you on this one, Brian? I really feel like his whole style puts me firmly in between liking or disliking it. Kind of like I said earlier that this, this movie is just kind of like purgatory, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but his style is just, it's there. It just, it exists. Like, it doesn't push me one way or the other. Would you say you feel detached from the characters, though, because of that? Not detached, because he makes you feel for his characters, so that that exists. It's just... I, I, I can't put it any other way than it's it's there. It just it it is a a style. It is highly artistic. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely like you were talking about with the pages of a book. I mean, they, he literally puts it in this movie. Oh, and it's like a it fake book. With, That's right. It's, it's not like, even a real book. Yeah, it has chapters <laughs> yeah. and uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're at the library taking it out in the very beginning of this movie. So it, I mean, I completely agree with everything you said but in terms of me personally it just puts me in a it's a it's just the number five on a scale of one to ten you know it's it's just mm. it's it's there it doesn't roll his socks up it only it only gets them <laughs> over his toes so that's okay uh, one interesting thing that i noticed is did you notice jordan that this movie is set in 2001 it's set in 2001 yeah the gravestone uh, specifically oh, says 2001. Yeah, because that's when he that's when he died. But it doesn't feel like that, does it? No, because like well, one with the music, like it's a lot of like rock from the 60s and 70s, and like the style of mm -hmm. it, and like the coloring. Yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't think that. No, you wouldn't. And Wes makes a conscious decision. His own childhood seeps into all of his creations, mm -hmm. and there is always in every project that he's done a strong sense of nostalgia. And even as far as like 
uh, the part that Angelica Houston uh, plays an archaeologist, his mother was mm -hmm. an archaeologist, and his father was in advertising, and uh, you know he he writes what he knows, and so this sense of New York in the '70s and stuff like that comes in, mm -hmm. and in a way that that's what I was talking about. The family comes back home. Yeah. In a way, they're coming back home to what they loved as a kid, mm -hmm. when they were happy, when they were geniuses, when they were on top of the world. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I think the fact that the 70s, 60s songs and yeah. wardrobe and retro styles and sense of the colors of the home and stuff like that, I think that's a big part of it. And I thought it was interesting that he, like, you can kind of tell it's New York, but it's not blatantly... New York. Right. He doesn't show you any iconic yeah, parts of New York. Yeah, which is very purposeful. Yeah. Yeah, which makes sense to the, that alluding to like you feel, you know that feeling. You're like, this is familiar. How do I know this? Oh, it's New York City, but they're not telling you like, all right, this family, like classic New York family. Like yeah. it's that. So like, where are they from? They could be anywhere, but also this feels familiar somehow. The scene where they were at the, I think. Uh, the why? Uh, um, I think there's a park, a scene where they're at their park, oh, and he yeah, specifically had somebody stand in front of the Statue of Liberty so they didn't see yes. the Statue of Liberty. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're right. It's a very conscious decision. He, yeah. he wants you not distracted by the character of New York, but this is just the feeling. The New York-ness without, like, New York City. Right, exactly. Earlier, uh, Jordan mentioned adults who behave as children, particularly mm -hmm. men, man-childs, as it's sometimes referred to, or kids that act like sophisticated adults. Brian, did you see this in this particular movie? Oh, certainly. I mean, it's it's all about what how Gene Hackman plays that role. And he may not like when people write scripts for him specifically, mm -hmm. but man, when it works, it really works. Yeah, that's for sure. So I thought Chaz was one of these man-child characters. Yeah. Did you agree with that? Yeah, because you can see him really not being able to... You, you, He doesn't know how to process his feelings, and then also in the way that he reacts to things in conversations, like when when um, Royal first sits down with the kids and Margot and Ritchie are on the couch, and then Chaz is like over in the corner reading a book, kind of answering very like, well, what are you going to... Kind of like very instigatory. He doesn't, you can tell he's, like, he put put up this front with his father, but then also, um, which is a, a line that I wrote down when they're in the hospital after Richie has attempted to take his life, and Richie talks about how he wrote a letter, but he wrote it after the fact. It, was it a dark letter? Yeah, and he goes, of course it's dark. It's a suicide note. I love that. So it's, like, it's such a great line because it sets, it set, sets Richie up for, like, a very Wes Anderson deadpan dark humor, and then it showcases Chaz, like, being like, well, yeah, duh, it's a suicide note. Like, you can see Chaz's childishness in the way that he's asking questions about it and not having the same regard for the seriousness of the situation that an adult would have, where you'd kind of be more coddling or he's just asking very blunt questions to his brother who just attempted to take his life, so. Absolutely. And uh, I think in some ways, Richie goes back to childlike tendencies as a man, too, as he goes in his tent. And yes. as well as he oh. comes back home mm -hmm. and he seems very that fragile. That tiny yellow tent in that huge room, just like this little tent. Yeah, yeah he, he feels like there's a sense of, you know, childhood coming back home yeah. as well. And so, and then obviously Royal is a childish <laughs> yes. character in his own right. Yeah. So. Another one of the themes like that I found for Wes Anderson was impressive men having a breakdown, which I couldn't figure out if that applied to Royal in this situation. I know in other, like, other Wes Anderson movies, but you don't, there's not a part in the movie where they're talking about how successful either Royal was, or even really, well, Chaz, I feel Richie. like, is the situation. Or Richie, Richie yeah. Richie has, like, he's, he he's on top of the tennis yeah. world, and then he has that huge meltdown. Yeah. And Eli, too. Yeah. Eli's a moderately successful character himself who then is, destroys himself mm -hmm. through drugs. Richie, that scene where Richie is, like, losing that huge game, that was one of the first scenes that Wes Anderson knew he wanted to do for the movie. It was like that, and then, um, oh crap, what was the other one? Brian, you're a tennis fan. Did yeah. you like Did you like uh, Richie's tennis meltdown? <laughs> when he like, takes his shoe I, off? It was funny. When he, yeah, the, the shoe thing was really funny. Um, I'm, I'm actually an oddity when it comes to tennis. I absolutely love to play tennis. I can't watch it. Oh, okay. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult thing for me to watch on television because all that ends up happening is I want to go play. 
And if <laughs> you just get up, you know, yeah. So I just get up and end up going out and hitting some balls against the wall or, or going down to the club or something like that. So, uh, yeah, it's a weird thing. I actually do, however, love tennis movies. Uh, um, are there a lot of them? I don't know them? if you guys ever saw Wimbledon. Wimbledon, but, yeah, the, uh, you, you, you beat me to it. Uh, did you see Battle of the Sexes? Uh, oh, I, I didn't, see but that. I did really enjoy it. Did you guys see the HBO special with Andy Sandberg and um, uh, Sandberg. McEnroe? Kit Harrington? Oh, no, I don't know. It's called it. Seven Days in Hell, and no. it's about a, uh, it's it's about the longest ten match ever but it's a, it's a completely fictitious comedy they even got the serena uh, or the the williams sisters uh in yeah. on it and it is hilarious i'll have to and, watch that i'm like uh, a so fan I, of anything I, that that andy samberg does he's just so funny basically andy <laughs> samberg plays this johnny McEnroe character and kid harrington plays this like born and bred specifically for tennis and doesn't mm-hmm. have any mind outside of it character Mm -hmm. and it is seriously one of the funniest things i've ever seen in my life well sign me up for that yeah back to the color that you were mentioning earlier wes obviously if you notice from movie to movie he has palettes that he has that are reoccurring elements throughout the movie but as well as he uses the mood of each scene Mm -hmm. to define the mood in this and so uh with tenenbaum uh here you there's Bright red mm-hmm. is Yellow. carried throughout the movie, but like if you were to watch Life Aquatic, there's like these splashes of like bright orange yeah. through there, um, or Darjeeling Limited Yellow, for mm-hmm. instance. And so there are a couple of big, um, you could say, trends throughout the movies. He uses red often to emphasize boy boy like nature. So again, Chaz yes. and his boys in these red jumpsuits. Uh, there's a, a yellow is frequently to him the hope of youth and he usually goes with a mustardy gold not mm-hmm. like a really bra- bright in your face gold and then obviously blue pale blues are something that he's a fan of and these often represent melancholy and sadness and the biggest example of that's when Richie cuts his hair off and he's blue. in this extremely blue room yes. with this blue light and uh, uh, really awesome so I think his, I don't know if his eyes are blue but yes. that tone, like his eyes are blue and it's so, it's such a raw, you're just staring at him, like shaving his head. It's such a, it, I feel like it's such a tonal difference from the rest of the movie. Like there's not a lot of blue and then it's so blue. Totally. Now, Brian, I know for me when I watched this the first time, when we went to the scene where Luke Wilson is so distraught that he attempts mm-hmm. suicide, this is where I got off because I was just like, whoa, I don't, I can't follow you here. This is going mm-hmm. too dark for me. Is this where, is this a down moment for you? I mean, I think watching something that personal um, would be a down moment for anybody. Um, But I also, I mean, he's, he's probably the character who has lost the most in the movie. Uh, He's Mm -hmm. also probably the best person out of the group. Um, And because of that, I think he feels every bit of the negativity that the rest of the family puts out. So I would, I would almost say that he's the only one that really shows me um, echoes of the mom. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Okay. I, I, I do see that. I mean, I, I found myself gravitating towards Danny Glover being like I thought this family needed him and I thought that was cool that Gene Hackman realizes that in himself and that he can be part of this family Mm -hmm. but Henry brings something that he could never be and he even says at one point I see why you like him he's everything that I'm not (laughs) yeah but I mean I think right because Richie I mean always being kind of a a daddy's boy if you will like is is instantly like very forgiving. He's the favorite. Yeah, he is the favorite, and then immediately, and that's like a point of contention between Chaz. Oh, no, Chaz himself. hates it. Oh yeah, he's like, why are you being so nice to Dad? You know, yeah. so you poor dumb sucker. Yeah, which I mean, if you're talking about being similar to his mother, like his mother obviously also has a soft spot for. I mean, they're still married. Yeah. Uh, even after 22 years he is charming. of not he is charming. He's a charming liar. Yeah, he's a very he's a son of a bitch, you know. <laughs> so, he's a lying liar who lies. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, I know you're a passionate mu- music fan. Jordan, I know you appreciate music as well. Oh, this movie and Wes Anderson in general 
I think he's got quite a knack for picking mm-hmm. out some great songs. And as we talked about, we've got a 60s, 70s palette here. Brian, what did you think about some of the soundtrack here? Uh, you want to go through a few of them? Like, uh, you know, first... I actually took a couple... Well, I, I, I actually took a couple songs from the soundtrack mm-hmm. and and you uh, put them on my oldies playlist on my phone. <laughs> Just one of those things where I was... Uh, I was really, really impressed by the soundtrack, but I also wasn't surprised. You know, I think it's interesting that he goes for uh, big artists or iconic artists at the time, but he never goes for the big hits, you know? Mm-hmm. Obviously, Hey Jude, huge hit, but yeah. aside from that, like, Bob Dylan, big name, mm-hmm. Wigwam, yeah. that's not a big Bob Dylan song. Uh, you know, he goes to the Rolling Stones, yes, but... Uh, Ramones. Yeah, in the Ramones. But, I mean, also there's some other songs that are not the obvious choice mm-hmm. in there, so... And then after being in the movie, they have, like, a resurgence. And, mm-hmm. like, they, the, the song that he chose then becomes, like, much more popular. Like, one of the things that um, the song... I, I think he, they were talking about These Days by Nico. Oh, it was yeah. a Nico song. This is the song when Gwyneth Paltrow gets off yes, the bus. Yes, and it's slow-mo, and, like, Nico has this, like, this, this very soulful voice. I feel like, because he also said that that was, that was one of the first scenes, too, that he, he knew that that song one needed to be in it, and he knew the scene. Like he, so it, you can see him already pairing, because also the music guy, the guy who, uh, Randall Poster, I think is his name, is I think has done all like is involved in almost all the Wes Anderson movies and is one of that is like in, a part of his gang mm-hmm. and um, Wes was describe, describing him as almost kind of like a producer like he's a, around as much as a producer which isn't as common I guess for the p- people who like are in charge of like picking the music and editing um, because he wants to really I think get more into the story and really be able to pick kind of the best music for you know the situation so. So I thought Hey Jude was awesome when they, they go yeah. they go around meeting everybody uh, and it's kind of a triumphant time uh, before they fall on hard times. Because then the bird, like Mordecai, like flies off then, like during like the na, 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 and so epic. Oh, yeah. Paul Simon. Uh, Since you brought that up, I want to just to jump in for one second. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I absolutely love the use of animals in this movie. Yes. Mm-hmm. Anything, anything specific? Uh, just... Uh, um, Buckley, uh, Luke Wilson's Buckley. yeah. Well, uh, Luke Wilson's uh, relationship with the Falcon, Mordecai, and then you know, you know Buckley, Mordecai, and then even the the Dalmatian at the end, um, or the Dalmatian a, mice that appear just randomly. I love that. Yeah, it's in the very right. beginning when I'll you see the spliced. book. Yeah, he spliced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I don't know. I just that was that was one of the really enjoyable parts of this is how they use the animals to really convey. Because you look at Luke Wilson's character and like he's all about setting things free um, yeah. and getting very little in return. I thought that that was symbolic too. And uh, actually, uh, there's a uh, song by Velvet Underground where we're talking about songs when Mordecai. Uh, comes back to Richie on the roof when he's reconnecting with his father. And in a way, that's emblematic of his family's coming back together, and that's when Mordecai comes back to Mm -hmm. him and things are starting to fit into place again. And he's been gone for so long, and this is what's put Richie in the dark. He doesn't have his family. He doesn't have anybody that he truly loves. And Mm -hmm. he now has Margot, and she's with him, or as good as she gets to be with anybody. And uh, he's got his family back. And so Mordecai comes back at this time yeah. and he has gray feathers. And it's like, you know, he's been through some hard days just as he has. And mm-hmm. I love that. So Yeah. And if, if, if you talk about kind of Richie setting Mordecai free and respecting that, he's been in love with Margot his entire life, but does not really force that upon her in any way and try to put her in a box. He, like, not that he lets her, like, she does not need permission, um, but she gets married, she has all these things, and he, he, he lets her be free. He yeah. loves her from afar, and, you know. I don't know, think he knows like, about some of the stuff, because he puts his hand through a window and he finds out some of the stuff. Oh, he, no, there's no way. There's no way he didn't. I mean, that's what kind of set him over the edge. Yes. You know, oh, of course. So, but yeah, like him kind of, at least with, you know, he kind of, he reacts to it, but he doesn't react towards her it's all inward and you know speaking of that rebellious part of Margot, i'm a huge ramones fan they're one of my favorite top five band for me and so i actually i 
extra appreciate Judy as a punk yeah. while she's yeah. going through the rebellious phase there. Um, and I, I, that, that's one of my favorites. Uh, other great music moment, Brian, what do you think about Needle in the Hay by Elliot Smith from the suicide oh. scene? Um, I don't think I have a particular opinion on that specific song use, but I do really enjoy that song. Okay. Man, I, I just thought that was so... so it, it hit the melancholy tones for me. What yes. about you, Jordan? Yeah, I, I feel like that fits, like, the, the color change plus that song. I think Needle in the Hay is one of those songs that became... Not that it was ever not popular. I didn't know the song before I listened to this movie. And then when I was kind of looking up the music of this movie, that Needle in the Hay and then These Days by Nico are at, like, the top of the playlist. Like, those are the ones that are getting... Ruby people. Tuesday also, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I think I mean, are, mm-hmm, are yeah. the ones that people are like, oh, that's Royal Tenenbaums. Yeah. Like, they kind of associate, if you're not already a fan, and, you know... So Wes song. Anderson goes back to the Stones a lot, and frequently he yeah. uses the Rolling Stones in a big moment in the movie, and mm-hmm. it's a big moment in this one when we hear Ruby Tuesday in the tent, and yeah. that's when Margot uh, climbs on the bed Love. with him, and, and it's a that's a really great scene, too, and... Uh, I love that song as well. Mm-hmm. So, uh, And then one I'm going to guess Brian likes because he mentioned liking Gene Hackman showing the boys how to have fun. Oh, yes. The, Paul Simon's Me and Julio went down to the schoolyard. Yeah. I, I thought this was a fun... Yeah, there, 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 there's some youthful, joyous tones to this one. So I'm, I'm assuming... Did I fairly peg you as this is a good musical moment for you, Brian? Oh, certainly. You know, there are a couple movies that really stand out in terms of everything I've ever watched and what the soundtrack did for it. And this is definitely one that benefits greatly from it. Mm-hmm. I, I think Wes has such great attention to detail. Like, this is an expensive soundtrack, but uh, mm-hmm. it's worth it, every penny. And like I said, he didn't necessarily go out and get the hottest songs from the 60s and the 70s. Mm-hmm. He's not just hitting you over the head with the fact that he's, like, this is nostalgic, get it. You know, like, he's... He they they fit the tone of the songs. Yeah. It's so. not like the current trend in Marvel movies where you take this like iconic rock song that everyone already knows yeah. and put it in the trailer and it's a way to like really like be like ah oh, I love this like everyone already knows the song you know all that jazz. Yeah, you know, and uh, something emblematic of the Wes Anderson does he has a lot of dry, a lot of dry, a lot of dry, and then he has like moments of yeah. big violence that comes out like with these huge like rim shot like drums mm-hmm. and stuff that come out like when Eli like drives the car like frenetically or like when he's escaping out the window <laughs> yeah. or like Chaz is chasing after Eli mm-hmm. actually I'm realizing Eli has a lot of these scenes in this movie yeah it's but, Eli yeah. he's the chaotic figure yes but uh, it's interesting That's uh, and Wes keeps you down low he likes the ukuleles mm-hmm. he likes the low key stuff even some mm-hmm. strings and violins and stuff like that keeping you sophisticated and then he hits you over the head like with the Ramones like you know like it's like yeah, a jolt, yeah. like, Chucky yeah. is a punk, yeah. Judy is a run, and I'm just like, yeah. You're into it, yeah. And so it, what it does is, like, compress and release. It's a, like mm-hmm. a, um, that's a very architectural term for, like, bringing you into a small space mm-hmm. and then then kicking you into a big space. And mm-hmm. then it's it's more effective than if you would kick somebody straight into an even bigger you space You appreciate the big space more because you've just been in a tiny space. You're like, I love this space, it's huge. Yeah, and so the moments of, like, somebody striking somebody in a Wes Anderson movie, yeah. it, it seems more, whoa! Like, out of nowhere. You're like, yeah. where? why are these timid characters punching one another? Like, where did this come from? The, yeah, so I, I think that that's, some, that that's part of Wes's humor. And, and it, again, it's subtle, so... Mm-hmm. Uh, so much to talk about, but look for this. Uh, Brian, do you have any fun facts or little moments that you wanted to call out? Uh, just uh, that I really, really like it when brothers get together on movies. So having Luke Wilson and Owen Wilson in the same movie is just always something that's a lot of fun to me. Mm-hmm. Um, except when your last name's Affleck. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jordan, look for this. Look for this. Well, the one that um, I think one of like the funniest moments of the movie is when Eli. I think it's when Margot first moves into the house, and Eli and her meet up in some capacity, and Royal is leaning out his window smoking, and then looks down and sees Eli climbing out of the window, and says like, "Hey, I know you," and Eli just kind of like looks up. And then just like like a like he's in a Broadway musical, just like shoots his hand in the air, and then just hops over the fence. Like doesn't say anything. He's just like he- like hand in the air and jumps over the fence. And you're like, what? It's just such a weird 
such a weird character. And then kind of in more on like researchy terms, um, in the tra- I, I watched the original trailer for the movie because mm-hmm. I was just interested, like how are they pitching this? And one of their taglines was, family isn't a word, it's a sentence. Interesting. And I, yeah. I didn't quite... The tagline. Yeah, I didn't quite get it, honestly. I was like, family isn't a word, it's a sentence. Does that mean like family is much more than what you think it is or I just I didn't ex- I wasn't expecting that when I watched a trailer I was like what is it what do they mean here what is that family isn't a word it's a sentence that was like at the end of the, end I of like, the trailer I like that yeah. yeah I thought it was intriguing but I couldn't I still am not sure I tried to get to the bottom of it but guys in the comments down below let us know family isn't a word it's a sentence what do you guys think uh, it's <laughs> Um, I think another interesting moment, as you mentioned this earlier, when Richie's on the in the bird pen, yeah, and the, he breaks the glass when he's talking to Bill Murray, and like he just can't take it, so he punches the glass. Yeah. This is actually an acting decision that was unscripted. Luke Wilson made a decision and quickly decided to just punch the glass, and like it caught Wes Anderson a little off guard, and so like he goes to a close up uh, view because uh, he's actually worried that uh, he actually really hurt his hand. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, I think all turned out somewhat well. It's not advisable, and it wasn't set up with the fa- special safety <laughs> glass and all that stuff. So that was a fun, fun little detail. Uh, Brian, any other ones? No, not really. Um, I did agree that I, I really liked that scene. Um, the other one I really enjoyed was uh, the interaction between Gene Hackman and the butler. <laughs> the butler assassin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> was oh, yes. Where is that? Really... <laughs> Yeah, I mean that is it's the last time you stick me. <laughs> I just uh the only times I laughed in this movie were with Gene Hackman and him. And Pagoda. And, and yeah. It was just Yeah, Pagoda, that's right. I, I keep forgetting his name. You know he saved my but, life, yeah. right? Yeah. Wow, really? <laughs> yeah. I was stabbed and he carried me to safety. Who who stabbed, who, who stabbed you? Well, Pagoda. <laughs> there there was a bounty on me. You're like, I, what? It's so absurd. It, Oh, that was really funny. Um, Jordan, any other look for this moments? Uh, no, that's it. Okay. I had one last one in that Henry Sherman was Wes Anderson's landlord. And so oh. Danny Glover's character was named after his landlord. So that's kind of a fun fact. That's fascinating. Um, and I would, I, there's no other way to bring this up, but uh, we're talking about all the Wes Andersonisms mm-hmm. here, and we've actually not covered them all. We've had to, you know, go to what we can. Maybe there'll be more of those later. But uh, if you have not... If you're not a Saturday Night Live watcher, my favorite TV show, you have got to look up the Wes Anderson horror movie uh, spoof that they did. It's a trailer, (gasps) and it's called The Midnight Coterie of Sinister Intruders. (laughs) And it's Owen Wilson, played by Edward Norton in a household, and he looks out the window, and it's got all these people, like, with like masks on and cleavers and they're just standing there in a very stiff Wes Anderson sort of stylized manner and like ukuleles are playing. And he's like, <laughs> hey, hon, check this out. I think we're about to get murdered. <laughs> and like, it's got yeah. Gwyneth Paltrow sitting there smoking a cigarette in the corner. She goes, you don't say. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. And uh, he goes, yeah, there's a guy with a meat cleaver, an old record player, and there's Danny Glover. And like, he's just like, hello. <laughs> And so it shows, then he's like, he tells the kids to go into the panic room. They all sit in like, like Indian style in like the living room and they all get in this tent and they're like, the, like it's like with two precocious children. As they sit there, <laughs> we have to defend ourselves. And they still like, so they go slingshot, like, like baseball bat, like, and like, like they're labeling. Whimsical violence. Yes, exactly. They're, they're labeling all these things. So like picture of Edith Piaf, <laughs> little tiny flag. And, like, and then like they come in and everybody's too late. Uh-huh. And so uh, it's just this is a this is one of my favorite uh, pre-recorded movie uh, spoofs that they did, and so the Midnight Coterie of Sinister Intruders, That's really fantastic. funny. And I also particularly like that at the end uh, they said uh, Rolling Stone says you had me at Wes Anderson, yeah. and then Fangoria Magazine yeah. rates Duffa. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> How does this movie affect you, Brian? Without saying you're in purgatory. Uh, how does the movie affect you? That sounds so negative. I truly mean this is like, I, just no leaning. <laughs> Perfectly in the middle. So you're, stick, you're sticking with it, huh? Yeah, I, it, 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 it simply is. Okay. Mm-hmm. Jordan, how does this movie affect you? 
I, I mean, I recommended this movie. I really, I really enjoy being like lost and like I like lost in a movie and feeling like I'm in a different world. So something like this where the characters are really defined and very, not that they're all very sure of themselves, but they're very iconic in their own way. I really get along with. I think the character arc that I really love is watching Chaz and then watching him just like being pushed, being pushed, and then finally... Because I, I think the, su- the suicide scene for me is very sad, but the moment at, um, when when Ch- Royal is giving Chaz the Dalmatian and he goes, Dad, like I've, I've really had a hard year. Like, a hard year. Just the, the admittance of that and that you can kind of hear in his voice the the relief of admitting to struggling with something. I feel like my, that tugs at my heartstrings a little yeah. bit. And I, I, I was like, I've, you, you kind of, it takes you back to your life. And it was a moment where I really, it really feels real. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm the opposite of Brian. I actually really love Stiller. Yeah. And I, I like how big he goes when he goes goofy. Mm-hmm. And I love that he can do angry. He yeah. does a slow burn well as you see him go from like being agitated to like blowing up flat out like huge angry really well mm-hmm. and he uses him for comedic purposes or for dramatic purposes and as you mentioned Brian he does actually do serious yeah. pretty well too. I so. think it fits this movie really well because he's he feels like the most I think Ben Stiller has like a very certain way of acting like he's always kind of Ben Stiller wherever he goes. Some actors are like that and it works. And I think in this movie it really works because all the other characters are a little bit more like more like reserved or quiet and then he's very... Anderson, yeah, exactly. And Ben Stiller, you're at first you're like, what? Ben Stiller's in this movie? But I think it fits super well. I think he's the most feeling character and, yeah. it, and you know, his anger and stuff is... I don't know. I, I'm with mm-hmm. you. For me, this just movie takes me back to even when times are tough and you might yell at each other and your family might be giving you a hard time, you're still better off with them than if they had left. And yeah. when Royal leaves his family high and dry, they fall apart and they struggle. And even though as he's not the perfect father, in a way when he comes back together, they all come together. And that's the big theme of this movie. Mm-hmm. He, when he returns, the family begins to heal. And I really like it on his uh, at the epitaph or on his on his gravestone. Uh, you know, 1931, sorry, 1932 to ni- 2001, died tragically rescuing his family from the wreckage of a destroyed sinking battleship. Perfect. And that, in a way, is a metaphor, which totally a lie to make himself look good, which is so royal. Yeah. But on the other hand, I like that it's a metaphor for the fact that the family was all in depression. They were all sad. Everybody's life was on hold, and in returning, mm-hmm. they healed. So mm-hmm. it just makes me happy to have, uh, you know, good wife, great parents, and just it yeah. it uh, it makes you appreciate your family. So. It's it's a very like sappy message, but it doesn't feel sappy when you're watching it. It's not like and now everyone is cured. Like there is kind of a sense like he walks you through and shows you okay, Margot has a very successful play based off the thing, and kind of shows you that each character is successful, but it doesn't feel overly. Like, da-da-da-da, and everything's better now. Like, too cheesy of a film narrative. So, I think that works well. So, guys, let's get into the superlatives. Are you ready, Jordan? I'm ready! Why don't you start us off by giving us your MVP of the Royal Tenenbaums? I think I think it's pretty clear from just kind of the opinions I've voiced thus far. I feel like Ben Stiller and his character really ground this movie in a great way. I was I was struggling to pick an MVP because I think... Each character is so unique, and you can get really wrapped up in them. But Ben Stiller's character arc, and I think what he brings to the character, really helps bring a tone of reality to the movie, which I think is fantastic. And then Luke Wilson was my close number two, because I think he did a fantastic job. But from what we said, I think Ben Stiller, I don't know what Brian will say. but <laughs> We are about to find out. Brian, what do you say? Who's your MVP? Uh, I'm going Gene Hackman. Uh, yep. Okay. I uh, like I said, he was he was really the bright spot in this movie for me. Um, I think he really nailed it, and not that he doesn't always nail it, but um, yeah, I just he was uh, he was integral. Okay, and I'm actually gonna second that one. Go with Gene Hackman mm-hmm. on this one. His charming, but also prickly nature. He does seem very slimy, and you could see how he could have duped this poor woman into a relationship that's for sure time and time again but I was very close to picking Ben Stiller yeah. as well so I, I mentioned why he is so awesome too so those were definitely my top two choices which brings us to best supporting actor I'm gonna go with An- Angela Huston 
or Angelica Huston. I feel like she brings, like what she brings to the mom character is like a tone of elegance and she's so smart and just her voice and how she speaks to her children. Mm -hmm. Like when she's able to, like Raleigh is not able to get into Margo. Margo's like not letting him into the bathroom whatsoever. He's so nice. And then he just goes like, she just goes like, honey, it's me and instantly let in. And it, she's just very, very matter of fact yeah. and so intelligent, but has that warmth and about when, when they're doing kind of that scene in the beginning where they're introducing all the children. She's the rock of the family. She is the rock. Like, and, and I, I just love that. I, I feel, and I think like just her specifically, just the way she did portray the role was fantastic. Brian, who is your best supporting actor? I'm going to go with Gwyneth Paltrow on this mm-hmm. one. Um, I think, although her character is not a very nice person, I think that she did a fantastic job conveying that cynicism. And I really, really just... I She was one of the people that's really enjoyable to watch play that part. Interesting. I uh, didn't see that one coming, actually. So... Uh, I thought that, one, that might be a less demanding role, yeah. but that's interesting. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, and it's a good, good perspective. I'm going to go with uh, Ben Stiller on this one. Uh, like I said, he was nearly my MVP, so I had to give him Best Supporting Actor in this one. As Jordan and I, and, or Jordan and I both pointed out, he just does such a good job of playing the emotional side of this, whether it be the angry side, the, um, the hatred that he has for <laughs> his father so much so that it ruins his relationship with his brother how serious and organized he is, he, how he dresses his kids and stuff the same way. I just, I really like his OCD nature and, uh, you know, I, I thought his his uh, admission that he needed help was great and I just, Ben Stiller uh, here for me. So, uh, hidden gem, Jordan. My, my hidden gem is Dudley, uh, <laughs> the boy who uh, Raleigh is working with, specifically the scene where Margot is leaving, leaving Raleigh and she's getting into the cab and Dudley just goes, like, this taxi has so many dents. There's a dent. And then conversation happens. There's another one. And it's just, you're just like, why is this kid speaking right now? And he's, I, he, I don't know, that scene I just, I thought was so funny. Can the boy tell time? <laughs> oh, God. No, no. oh, gosh, no. It's no. like they, but I love the relationship that him and Raleigh have. Like, there's a level of respect there. It's not like he's, like, taking advantage of this poor kid. And they, I, I feel like they're really good for one another. Like, Dudley is supportive and, like, like helps Raleigh in a way that I think Margot never never has. I could watch a whole segment of yes. Raleigh and... A short clip, like, <laughs> yeah. extra in the bonus feature. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, it reminds me of Ghostbusters, the opening scene at Ghostbusters when Bill Murray's <laughs> testing these people out for psychic abilities and like he's giving them tests and like, oh, yeah, like yeah. what's the card that I have on my head and yeah. like and then they say and then like he buzzes the guy for getting it wrong. I just got that vibe of him like testing Dudley out. It's like, yeah. make your shapes like my shapes. Yeah. <laughs> it's completely different. Yeah. He's, he's like he's like he's got like a smile on his face. What are you <laughs> gonna do with that red one? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, God. I love that part. Tremendous. Fa- fascinating. Yeah. It's so, it's so fantastic. And he calls out. He's like, he's like, he's colorblind, but has a very acute a sense of hearing. Yeah, like, what? I'm colorblind? He says yeah. from like two rooms away. He goes, I'm afraid so. <laughs> oh, my, yes. That's perfect. Uh, uh, Brian, Hidden Gem. Uh, hidden Gem, I've got to give it to... Um, uh, Kamar Palana's Pagoda. Yes. Uh, like I said earlier, it, it's it, it's so much fun watching the interaction between him and Gene Hackman. Mm-hmm. I I almost wish I had like some clarity on whether or not they got along as actors. Mm. That'd be interesting to know. Sounds like Hackman was a hard guy to get along. I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. sad to hear that. I like Hackman so much. I, 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 I'm, had, I'm sad to hear that he gives people a hard time. But uh, I'm going to go with Seymour Castle, the guy who plays Dusty, the elevator operator oh, slash yes. fake doctor. This guy just seems so wily and so, uh, again, he, he does phony guy so well. And I'm glad you picked Pagoda because I was almost – those are great uh, – there's a lot of you, – you can tell you have such a good cast when mm-hmm. you get all those good uh, hidden gems – out of it so uh recast if you had to recast somebody or got to recast somebody jordan who would it be and why i i kind of brought this up before but i'm i'd be curious to see if you would recast raleigh st Clair. so if it wasn't bill murray because i feel like bill murray is an 
oh, I he I know he's not in every single Wes Anderson movie, but he's in almost every single Wes Anderson movie. Yeah. And I feel like in this movie, he doesn't like he. I mean, his relationship with Dudley is fantastic, but they're also like his relationship with Margot. I feel like like he somehow seems like underutilized. Yes, he is. So underutilized. I'd be curious. If it was someone else, if you would, if the character of Raleigh St. Clair just really faded away, that might like, make or, it like, easier. What would on happen? Me. That, yeah, I might because that's my big reservation of this yeah. movie. I don't feel good about what happens to poor Raleigh. Yeah, because you're like, oh, the, that's Bill Murray. Like, and everyone, you know, everyone loves him. So I'd be curious what would happen. Not that it should happen, but just curious what would happen. Okay. Yeah. Or if it was someone more dislikable, maybe I don't know. Yeah. Like he had it coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Brian. Who are you recasting and why? I really wanted to be funny and say Ben Stiller with just about anybody <laughs> yep. else, oh. but um, but I didn't. Uh, like I said, I didn't. I didn't really mind him so okay. much in this movie. Uh, my character uh, change is actually going to be a swap, and I understand you'd have to age him up a little bit, but I would love to hear Gene Hackman as the narrator, mm-hmm. Baldwin play the dad. Oh, that well, would be really interesting. Yeah, along the lines of what you're talking about, um, I. Love the cast in this movie so much. Mm-hmm. I had such a hard time. And Alec Baldwin's an awesome narrator, but for the simple fact that I have to replace somebody in this exercise, I'm going to go after Alec Baldwin. Mm-hmm. He, there are lots of people who could, could do a good job of narrating. And I actually gave my narration to Bill Murray because I thought he was so underutilized Honestly. that I thought like this would be another way to be like, get him in the fold more. Yeah. So, like, yeah. That's for sure. uh, best shot, Jordan. My best shot, I feel like when they are first introducing all of the characters and has their name at the bottom. I think that that is a, such a Wes Anderson thing to do and it shows you about his like choice of color and that material synecdoche, synecdoche that's a mouthful, with how what he puts in the background and just you instantly, you're like, I get this character, I get this character and I just love how I feel like it's such a great yeah, you're introduced, moment. Yeah, you're introduced to all their things. Yeah, and so yeah. I, I just feel like it, it, it's such a Wes Anderson Richie's thing to headband. do. Richie's headband. Yeah. Yes, and like yeah. you know, she has her uh, you know cigarettes, her cigarette, and, and like her, her dark nails. eyeliner. And yeah, like that's so her character. Mm-hmm. As you were and talking like the about. symmetry of that, I just feel like it just fits really well. And my my runner up was the way that um, Wes did the the suicide. I feel like is, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to pick the movie is I feel like it does a good job of it being Wes Anderson-y, um, but not over dramatic like I feel like a lot of uh, movies or TV shows play there, like, there's a sense of like respect and solace in it mm-hmm. that I feel like the blue and needle in the hay and all of it really did a great job so. uh, for me the best shot is going to be Owen Wilson and Ben Stiller laying on the ground in the Zen Garden yes. and they look up to the sky and Ch- Eli's like I need help and Ben Stiller's like I do too <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really like that moment, and I like that shot, the perspective, and yeah, it's it's a good shot. So, Brian, or sorry, uh, Jordan, uh, what is your best scene? Um, I think one of my favorite scenes is when Royal takes Ari and Uzi out in the town, and the, the line is, I think he says, "Let's take things out and chop them up." Yeah. <laughs> and then you hit the music, and they go to the pool. They're running in traffic. He takes them to the dog fight. Like our, I forget which son has like blood on his face. Yeah. And it's just a oh, fun yeah. it's a oh, fun it's little time. Blood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no worries, it's just dog's blood. <laughs> uh Brian, uh best scene. Uh my favorite scene is gonna be uh Gene Hackman and Pagoda when he stabs him the second time. <laughs> okay. It is a good one. Yeah. I feel like I've harped on about Gene Hackman and Pagoda like the entire time, but it's it it really was like my That's favorite vein of the movie. Mm-hmm. So my best scene is going to go to Danny Glover revealing that Royal is indeed not yes. sick and that he doesn't have stomach cancer. <laughs> and uh, again, I like I like his character so much that uh, I like that he got the upper hand here and mm-hmm. that he was a smart person. He took the pills that were definitely Tic Tacs. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> Uh, just, I really enjoyed this. So, change one thing if you had to, Jordan. Um, I would be curious to get a little bit into. I, I know that they they allude to Margot's background and they they leave it mysterious. Yes. But I'd be more interested. Just just how I said, like Raleigh Bill Murray seems like a little like underused. I'd be curious to like maybe get more into their relationship or a little bit like more into their dynamic because it's Bill 
I don't more know, because it's more Bill deadly. Murray. Yeah, I just feel like I'd be interested in in that little that little vein of the of the movie. Spinoff. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, Brian, change one thing and only one thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think if I had one thing to change, I would have a little bit more uh, detail on uh, Bill Murray. Yeah. Um, I always kind of got the feeling in the movie that they needed a stark contrast to Margot's character, and that's what Murray did. But I would have loved to have seen more of of that. Maybe even introduce this, yeah, and, and maybe even add a second patient. Okay. Ah. Like just m- more into his practice. Well, we're gonna be lined up. I'm I'm a variation of your all's. Uh, I want a better ending for Bill Murray's character. Yeah. I've, I would like to see him out on tour with Dudley and have yes. him bump into somebody that's his age who finds his work fascinating and then like just yes. like a simple and then he got married mm-hmm. and you know I just want a happy ending there for <laughs> and yes he is Poor successful Raleigh. and things go well for him and Dudley but uh, because Margot has left him so uh, high and dry I, I'd like to see yeah. just something a little better for him so all Bill Murray comments <laughs> awesome. uh, we like Bill Murray well, here and like you uh, well, like you were talking about with the, the symmetry of this movie, I think it would have been funny if he had met somebody, like you said, at the end of the movie, and it had been another psychiatrist, and it had been like another female child that has interesting issues. So it's like kind yes. of a Pac-Man, Mrs. Pac-Man. Maybe. I like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like a Sheldon and Amy. They're just both so yeah, uh, meant world. for each other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, best quote of the movie, Jordan. Okay, I think mine's gonna be: Can't someone be a shit their whole life and try to make up for it? I mean, don't don't people want to hear that? And then Margot replying, "Do they?" <laughs> <laughs> I just love the sassiness of that, and the whole movie's about redemption. So I feel like this really sums it up. That's a good one, Brian. Gene Hackman uh, talking to the kids, where he goes, "I'm sorry for your loss. Your mother was a terribly attractive woman." <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is good. Um, I really enjoyed, uh, so going back to Jordan's scene at the ice cream parlor, uh, she, Margo's sitting there and she says, you probably don't even know my middle name. Oh, yeah. And I was like, that's a trick question. You don't have one. And she goes, it's Helen. <laughs> ah, that was your, mo- that was my mother's name. <laughs> that made it into the trailer. That was something they put in the trailer. She's she like, I know it was. <laughs> so that whole interchange was just so She's good. Like, he didn't remember her own middle name, even though it was his mother's name. Nothing. Um, well, we've come full circle, and it's now time to give this movie a rating. And I usually get the way with the guest first, but I think Brian's showed his cards here. Huh? Brian, did you give this a 2.5 <laughs> out of 5? No, I'm, I'm going to bump it up by 1. I'm going to give it a 3.5. Uh, like a good wine, you know, letting it breathe a little bit. <laughs> Talking about this movie has made me realize I like it a little bit more than I thought I had. So uh, maybe we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go with 3.5 on this and be happy. Oh, a pleasant turnaround. Uh, Jordan, what would your rating be on a five-star scale? Okay, I'm going to give it a four. I'm not going to give it a five out of five just because I I kind of wish I'm a sucker for really being emotionally pulled into a movie, like I was talking about earlier. Um, and I this is emotional, but not quite, but just the world, the the you know the characters, the visuals. Four, four out of five for me. I'm going to go in stride with that. I'm going to go a four here as well. And um, uh, while I I am a fan of Wes Anderson, there's a part of Wes Anderson that, as you mentioned, Jordan, that probably will never get me all the way to the five level. And there's a degree of detachment that that deadpan delivery has. Mm -hmm. It's unique. I like it. And I really admire Wes Anderson's craft and consistency and how he's built a language Mm -hmm. for himself. Now, having said that, um, it's not a riot. And it does. Mm -hmm. uh, Dramedy is a hard spectrum for me to yeah. step into. But this is a well done one and I'm, I'm growing to like it more with time as Brian said. It's, it's aging well four mm-hmm. times across. I, I'm up to four stars now and so um, it, it just continues to go up. So uh, I had a lot of fun studying this movie though. Yeah. So it does hold up though, I think. Yeah. Speaking of movies that hold up, let's find out next time if another movie holds up. We're going to do a violent action movie next time or a stylish violent movie next time. Brian, are you ready to get dangerous? Yeah, let's get dangerous. Darkwing Duck style. Uh, Option number one. Kill Bill, volume one, from 2003. After awakening from a four-year coma, a former assassin wreaks vengeance on a team of assassins who betrayed her. Option number two. 
Apocalypto from 2006. As Mayan kingdom faces its decline, a young man is taken from a perilous journey to a world of ruled by fear and oppression. Option three, Pan's Labyrinth from 2006. In the phalangist Spain of 1944, the bookish young stepdaughter of a sadistic army officer escapes into an eerie but captivating fantasy world. Gonna go with Pan's Labyrinth on this one because I'm a huge Del Toro fan. I have not seen this one, and I'm kind of glad you picked that. So I'm looking forward to doing that with you next week. So if you haven't seen Pan's Labyrinth, please go back, refresh, and check it out. And we'll be happy to talk about it next time. Jordan, thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you. I hope you had fun. I had a wonderful time. For all of you at home, thank you for listening. All the Lords, Ladies, and Knights of the Retro Roundtable, we invite you to reach out to us. We do want to hear from you, so subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Give the show a rating and review. It takes 20 seconds, and it really helps us find other viewers and helps other people build the show. We show up in search results better that way. Uh, give us a like on Facebook. Uh, there's a lot of fun and content on there, and we definitely want to see you guys say whether you love the movie, hate the movie. Go ahead, argue with each other. Tell us why we're wrong, or tell us why we're right. And um, if you want to be on the show, if you want to have an increased dialogue with us, uh, email us at retromovieroundtable at yahoo.com. We're always looking for a good movie-loving guests to bring on the show. So, as always, thank you for listening. Be good to each other, and watch more movies. Brian? The thing is, Bob, it's not that I'm lazy. It's that I just don't care. <laughs>